Thanks so much, uh, Helena, for having me. It's, uh, it's a great honor to have uh, the possibility of presenting uh, this work uh, uh, in this workshop. Um, sometimes, uh, just uh, you know, uh, the disclaimer, sometimes it seems that I'm working, I'm looking upwards as if I'm reading a, a, an article uh, online instead of continuing with my talk, uh, but I'm not, just I have a strange uh, monitor configuration for, according to which the, the camera is on the bottom, but the big screen is on the top of it. That I know it gives um, a weird feeling, but trust me, uh, I'm all with you. And please feel free to interrupt me at any moment. So this is joint work with Andrea Tar and Eloisa Campione and Thomas Mariotti. Andrea um, and Eloisa are from the University of Rome. Uh, Thomas is from Toulouse. Okay, so let me give you a very short uh, motivation. It's a short talk, so I want to go fast to the heart of analysis. But uh, at the broad level, we are motivated by the observation of that uh, many socioeconomic uh, uh, problems can be thought of as games with competing mechanisms, whereby multiple principles non cooperatively offer procedures to determine relevant uh, uh, decisions by consulting with multiple agents. Application of competing mechanisms range from oligopoly to insurance regulation. Uh, design of tax schemes by multiple authorities uh, that jointly tax uh, um, multinational firms, political economy, competing auctions, uh, uh, and many others. So the theoretical literature on competing uh, mechanisms has established uh, three blocks of the results. And today, you know, I'm really focusing just on the theory of competing mechanisms. I will not cover any specific applications, but uh, Hopefully the ideas that um, I will uh, touch upon um, have um, uh, direct uh, application and implication for yes. many of the problems of interest. So the first result that uh, the theorists uh, um, noticed back in the 90s is that when you have competing designers, uh, the usual revelation principle does not apply. And the reason is that, uh, first of all, uh, agents possess uh, private information, not just about the exogenous payoff time, you know, the parameter that uh, moves preferences of technology, but they also have uh, private information about uh, the mechanism of uh, the other principles. And uh, a principal may want to consult with the agents, learn about the offers made by other principles, and then respond accordingly. But that cannot be done in full flexibility by restricting attention to the usual direct mechanism where the report is just the agent exogenous type. Second, out of equilibrium allocations uh, play an important role with competing designers. Namely, a principal may want to include in uh, his or her mechanism allocations that on path she doesn't expect uh, uh, they will be selected, but they are there with the purpose of it, uh, if other principal were to deviate, then the agents uh, may activate these out of equilibrium allocations and inflict punishment on the deviating principles. Lastly, when you have competing designers, standard direct revelation mechanism could be too restrictive in their ability to permit the principle to correlate uh, the actions with the private information of the agents. And the right mechanism provide a flexibility that permits it to sustain a joint distribution over exogenous types and pay off relevant decisions in a way that cannot be replicated with the language of traditional mechanism design. Actually, in response to this impasse, a second block of the literature has established the existence of a universal language that is rich enough to describe mechanisms in full flexibility. In an influential paper by Epstein Peters in the 90s, it has been shown that the type of an agent when communicating with a principal in a multi-designer settings should also include market information. But of course, you know, that was also noticed by McAfee and Peck, that's a challenge. Why? Because when a principal asks a vision to describe a mechanism, the principal, a mechanism offered by another designer, a principal should anticipate that the other designer mechanism may also require some description of the mechanism that uh, the principal under consideration is offering to her agents. So this naturally leads to an infinite regress in the description of the mechanism, which is complicated to deal with. The contribution of Epstein Peters is in showing existence of universal language completely in terms of the primitives of the model, namely in terms of minimal utility that each agent can get in each state of the world as a function of the minimal utility in a number mechanism iterated all the way up to infinity. 
with a property that uh, when you think about the right mechanism with this universal language, then you're back to a setting where you can establish an analog of the revelation principle by which principle can be restricted to offer mechanism with this language. The third block of the literature has moved away from the um, characterization of the canonical mechanism and instead investigated what payoffs and outcomes can be sustained with competing designers. And what has been noticed is that uh, contrary to games with a single designer, when you have multiple designers and multiple agents, typically it's the case that any incentive compatible allocation, incentive compatible in the usual Myersonian sense, that yields each principle payoff above an appropriately defined mean max mean threshold can be sustained in equilibrium. And that even without a repetition of interaction between the relevant players. I've already spoken for about, uh, I think my watch says six minutes about mechanism. But what, what, what is a mechanism? Well, I say, well, you must be joking. You know, this is qualified audience. So we all know what a mechanism is. Please move on. So a mechanism, typically the way we think of it, is a procedure to determine a some payoff relevant allocations, an element of, let's say, a set calligraphic A. And the way this element is selected is by letting uh, agents take actions, we typically interpret these actions as messages, and then specifying a rule phi that responds to the messages with possibly distribution over the relevant allocations. And in fact, this is exactly the way you know, the entire literature has proceeded in, uh, in the last uh, 40 or more years. This way of describing a mechanism is completely general when you have a single design. Nothing is missed or nothing relevant is missed from this description. But when you have competing designer, there's something important which is missed. What is it? Well, that's what we call private disclosure. What are private disclosures? Well, private disclosures are meant to capture the possibility that the different agents may be intentionally informed asymmetrically about the implication of the messages or the actions sent in the mechanism. And that cannot be done with this formalism. So in reality, what, what do private disclosure capture? Well, for example, they capture the possibility that the seller in an auction informs asymmetrically the buyers about elements of the auction, such as the personalized reservation prices. So uh, Elaine may know what is the reservation price that has been determined for, for her. She knows that it's correlated with mine, but she doesn't perfectly observe mine. And this has nothing to do with lack of commitment. Just think of an environment where principles in the traditional making design fully commit to their mechanism, but they also decide strategically to inform the agents asymmetrically about the functioning of a mechanism before agents move. So think about creating a collection of uh, these mappings and informing the agents asymmetrically about which particular mechanism is at play. So when it comes uh, to relationship between uh, in manufacturers and, uh, and retailers, Private disclosure, for example, capture the possibility of informing the retailers asymmetrically about the quantity of the output supplied to the different uh, retailers. When it comes to the provision of public goods, private disclosure capture the possibility that the different voters may be informed ex ante before they cast a vote about the specific feature of a public good that will be provided or about the procedure used to select the public good after soliciting the preferences of the voters. So mathematically, what is a mechanism with private disclosure? Well, a mechanism with private disclosure proceeds as follows. So for each agent, there is a set of relevant disclosure. Let's call it SI. And then let S be the product of these sets. A mechanism with private disclosure has a distribution sigma over S which is pre-committed. And then there's a rule that takes as input uh, S and the messages sent by the agents. These messages can be arbitrarily rich and can also unfold over multiple periods. 
and spits out a distribution over the relevant allocations. Please notice that once you fix the vector S, then the mechanism, once you fix the vector, is a canonical mechanism, the way we have always uh, thought of it. So it's a rule that uh, takes as input of the actions of the agents and responds with an action. But because the agents don't commonly observe a VS, each agent observes a little piece of S, VSI, there is asymmetric information among the agents about the consequences of the actions taken in the mechanism. So each SI parameterizes an entire hierarchy of beliefs over the mapping from messages to outcomes. So this is what the mechanism with private disclosure is all about. Now, why do I bother introducing private disclosure? Well, because it turns out that private disclosure, which are useless with a single designer, have uh, uh, important uh, implications when it comes to games with competing designers. And these implications, to the best of our knowledge, have not been investigated before. The first implication is the non-validity of the four theories. So what we show in the paper is that uh, um, certain allocations that are sustained with standard mechanisms are not robust. Furthermore, it's impossible to sustain all payoffs above the mean max mean level. And this is true no matter the richness of M, of a mass of space. There's no way you can move part of this uncertainty from one side of the equation to the other and still restore the full theory. The second result goes in the opposite direction. It proves the non universality of universal mechanisms. It shows that if exists a location with private disclosure, it cannot be sustained without. And again, this is true no matter how rich the mass of space is. So combining these two results, in our view, indicate that private disclosure has a very deep impact on uh, the functioning of these games. So the equilibrium set with and without private disclosure are not nested. So neither of the two is a superset of the other. But the entire way you should think about the interaction between principles and agents should be reconsidered. Let me be clear. Private disclosure, of course, you know, require more than one agent. You cannot have private disclosure with a single agent because what private disclosure do is they create asymmetry among the agents about the functioning of a mechanism. But now you may pause for a second and say, well, what about private disclosure in canonical mechanism design with a single design. Why no, no one has ever bothered talking about private disclosure? Why mechanisms have always been described this way instead of this way? And the answer is, this is just an implication of the revelation principle. It's true that the revelation principle has been established for this family of games, but it doesn't take much thinking to realize that with a single designer, private disclosure are useless in the sense that they only limit what can be sustained on the path. And the reason being is that giving information to the agents always goes in the direction of reducing the set of what can be implemented uh, on path. But we play a major role when you have competing designers. So let me pause for a second. I'm, a, I'm done with my introduction. I wanted to go to my uh, first uh, uh, result. But uh, if there are questions at this moment, I would be very happy to take them. Okay, so say, like, show us uh, first of the meat, and then we we'll interrupt you after we see exactly the details of, uh, of the results. So the plan for the rest of the talk is fairly simple. I'm going to um, talk about uh, the anti-full theorem first, and then finish by talking about the non-universality of standard mechanisms. All right, let's start with anti-full theorems. In a, a famous paper in uh, 2010, Takuro Yamashita, now in Toulouse, he was a student at Stanford back then, proved a theorem that established that um, in games with three or more agents, you understand the role of three in a second, every deterministic incentive compatible allocations, yielding each principal payoff above an appropriate min max mean threshold, can be supporting equilibrium. And this even without repetition of the game. Further literature 
has provided uh, some instances where the assumption of free agents uh, can be relaxed, has investigated the possibility of extending the result to stochastic rules, and has also investigated what is the appropriate min-max mean level for these games. For the type of game that uh, you're going to see in a moment, uh, all of these things are um, redundant in the sense that um, it's fairly clear that the Yamashita construction was already flexible enough to sustain all the relevant uh, payoffs and allocations. Uh, but I wanted to be aware of the fact that uh, there is a debate about um, uh, what is an appropriate min max mean threshold for this literature. Um, and the reason is that the one in the Yamashita original work is itself a function of the primitive class of mechanism for the principles, that's something not desirable because the class of mechanism is typically considered not a primitive of the game. But then a subsequent work by Troncoso and, uh, and Peters, uh, Tronco Peters and Troncoso Valverde, and uh, the entire Lich on contracts on contracts has shown how to extend the result in Yamashita to a lower min max mean threshold that is uh, you know, fully robust. So what's the idea behind Yamashita? Well, the idea is very simple. The idea is that principles can be punished by having the agents vote on a direct mechanism, on a standard direct mechanism. A standard direct mechanism is a mapping from payoff relevant types to allocations. So think of Omega with the usual product structure as the primitive payoff space. So an element of Omega is what, you know, Theories typically refer to as a state of nature. It's a collection of pieces of information that jointly fully parameterize technology and preferences. AJ, calligraphic AJ, is the space of all possible location for principal J, could be mixed between non monetary and monetary allocations. And DJ is the space of all such mappings from omega to AJ. A recommendation mechanism is essentially an enriched mechanism where in addition to reporting the types, each agent recommends a direct mechanism. And then the recommendation mechanism with a superscript R, just to make sure that we are all on the same page, proceeds as follows. It reads the messages, and if it finds that an appropriate supermajority of the agents has recommended the same direct mechanism, let's call it the D hat, then that direct mechanism is utilized in conjunction with the reports about the primitive types to determine the final location. If instead an appropriate supermajority has not been reached, then a default allocation is implemented. In the example that I'm giving here, the supermajority is a strong one. It involves I minus one agents. I is the number of agents out there. What's the idea behind Yamashita is that because the deviation by other principles are common knowledge among the agents, agents that can be induced to take a, a response to those deviations by coordinating on a direct mechanism that punish the deviator. And the incentive compatibility when it comes to the selection of a direct mechanism can be bypassed or can be trivialized if you wish with this type of supermajority rules, but de facto make none of the agents pivotal when it comes to the recommendation of a direct mechanism. If you have three or more agents, and if you expect the other two to already coordinate on the right uh, D hat recommendations, you know that whatever you're going to recommend is going to have no bite, but then you may as well recommend the mechanism that both on and off the path is meant to discipline the behavior of the other principles. Okay, now let's revisit this result in the context of a very concrete primitive game. So the primitive game proceeds as follows. There are three agents, quite free, because I want to give Yamashita a shot. I wanted to you know, confine attention to an environment where if it was not because of private disclosure, the full theorem would apply. The three agents are labeled A1, A2, and A3. The principles are P1 and P2. You need at least two principles. Principle one has a binary allocation. Well, you, you need each of the two principles to have at least two allocations. And these allocations are labeled X1 and X2. 
principle two has at least two allocations and the, the two relevant one are Y1 and Y2. Agent one has an exogenous type, which is either low or high. The same thing for agent two. Agent three possess no exogenous private information in this example. And A1 and the two types are perfectly correlated. So that's the simplest examples of that we could think of. Payoffs. The payoffs are described by the following two tables. And these two tables correspond to the two different states of the world, L and H. Remember that the two types are perfectly correlated. A1 and the two types are perfectly correlated. So de facto, there are only two states of the world that are relevant. The vectors in these matrices describe the payoff of principle two, that's the first entry, agent one and agent two. The payoff of agent three and the payoff of principle one are constant and hence omitted. What I want you to notice is, you know, at, of course, I don't expect you to read all, everything from the tables, but I want you to notice the following property. I want you to notice that the lowest possible payoff for principle two is five. That, that will be our mean max mean fraction. The maximum possible payoff is six. I also want you to notice that this example features uh, the following property. Principle two's payoff is a function of which decision the other principle, principle one, selects in each of the two states, and it's invariant in her own decision. For example, when uh, principle one takes a decision x1 and the state is low, principle two gets a payoff of five, no matter which decision she implements. If principle one takes a decision x2, principle two gets a payoff of six, no matter the decision uh, she takes. Of course, the decision she takes matter for the other players and hence plays a role when it comes to the overall interaction among the agents and the principal. I also wanted to notice that uh, to give five to principal one with probability one, it's essential that in state L, the decision X1 be implemented with certainty. And in the other state, omega H, the decision X2 being implemented with certainty. That's the only way you can uh, inflict a payoff of five to principle two. Okay, so let's consider now a game, Alayamashita. A game, Alayamashita, or a game uh, as in any of the other papers in the literature, is one whose timing proceeds as follows. First, nature moves and informs the relevant player, A1 and A2, about their types. Then the principle moves, and the principle simultaneously post mechanism and commit to them. Agents see the mechanism and takes actions. These actions are called messages. And then the decisions are determined by the combination of the messages with the selected uh, mechanism. Then the following result holds. Suppose that uh, each principle in the game gamma m has access to a set of messages which is rich enough. And here, rich enough, it means it's a superset of dj cross omega i for each agent. What does that mean? It means that there are enough messages for each agent to specify a recommendation about a direct mechanism and also to report her type. Furthermore, let's assume that f is finite so that equilibrium existence is not a problem. Any payoff for principle two in the set five, six can be supporting equilibrium. And this is what you know, theorists have interpreted as the analog of a full theorem in games with computer designers. Five, six is the feasible set. So there's no way you can go outside five, six. And any payoff in five, six can be sustained in equilibrium. How do you do that? Well, exactly with the logic of Yamashita of having the principle of a mechanism that in case the other principle were to deviate, entail the possibility for the agent to modify the mapping from the primitive types into the induced allocations. That type of flexibility is enough for you to sustain all payoffs in the feasible set. All right, now let's consider the same game, but this time we introduce private disclosure. 
So again, with private disclosure, essentially it's a game that operates pretty much like what I described a moment ago, except for one modification, which I'm going to describe in a second. So everything starts with the two agents being privately informed by nature, principles simultaneously post mechanism and fully commit to them. So I'm not uh, uh, relaxing the commitment assumption, I'm retaining the assumption that has been considered in most of the literature. And agents receive signals. Remember that these signals play the role of informing asymmetrically the agents about certain feature of the mechanism, like the reservation price that has been offered to them, but not necessarily the one that has been offered to others. Agents then send messages and decisions are determined. Then uh, the following claim turns out to be true. Suppose again that message spaces are rich. You know, if I confine attention to restricted uh, message space, then I'm not giving the full theorem a shot. So what does it mean rich is that they are arbitrarily rich, but uh, at the very minimum, we have to permit each agent to describe a direct mechanism and to report her type. But now, contrary to the game that I introduced a moment ago, let's suppose that principle two, P2 is the relevant one, principle one has a constant payoff, has at least two signals when communicating with agent one. So here the superscript is the principle. Sorry, I misspoke. The superscript is the agent, A1. The subscript is the principle, P2. So the cardinality of this set is greater or equal than two. What does that mean? It means that there are at least two different disclosure that principle two can make to agent one. You say, what about the other agents? I don't need to bother with that. You know, it would be enough to, to consider this simple case with only two disclosure for agent one. I can accommodate for each disclosure with the other agents. I'm not going to use that. And again, let's suppose that M and S are finite so that the existence of an equilibrium is not a problem. Then the following is true. In any PB of GSM, P2's payoff is above five plus K, where K is strictly positive. The precise characterization of K is in the paper. It's a function of the probability of the two states, the low state and the high state. So essentially what we're saying is that contrary to games without private disclosure, where everything in the interval five, six, in terms of payoffs for principle two can be sustained. Now, when you have private disclosure, there's a cutoff, five plus K, such that none of the uh, payoffs in the lower interval can be supported in equilibrium. And this is true no matter the richness of N. So that means that uh, the full theorem does not apply to these games once you, you accommodate for private disclosure. Let me pause for a second and then uh, I will give you a sketch of the, of the proof. Let me see if, um, if there are questions. Okay. Um, I have a question. <laughs> uh, uh, does, it, uh, does it matter that the um, principles uh, cannot communicate? Uh, you could imagine that also the principles among each other have can privately disclose. Would it uh, also change the results on top of um, your assumption? It will not, but thanks a lot for asking. So the, I would say 90% of the literature typically assumes that there is no direct communication among the principles. There is a subset of the literature that looks at the games on the contracts on contracts. Contracts on contracts are mechanisms that respond to mechanism of others without the need to have a better response being uh, obtain a full communication with the agents by having, a, for example, a judge observing all the mechanisms and then specifying a location in one mechanism as a function of what has been specified in the others. So here, not considering it for ease of, uh, of exposition, but the result that I just documented a moment ago, it also applies to games on contents on contents. Why? Because as you'll see in a moment, there is a way for me as a principal to offer a mechanism with private disclosure to my agents, but even if the other principal get to see it, will continue to permit me to walk away with a payoff strictly above five, no matter what the other principals do. 
So let me give you the proof of this result. So without loss of generality, suppose that the two signals are labeled one and two. And let's consider the following mechanism for principle two. It's a fairly simple mechanism. And that's why the, I think the idea is, is so robust. So with probability alpha, which is between a half and one, the mechanism selects the signal one and discloses it to agent one. And then implements the decision y1. With the complementary probability of one minus alpha, the mechanism selects the other signal that we label two, communicates the signal only to agent one, and then implements the decision y2 with no communication from the agent. So this is a mechanism where we say, look, I'm telling you guys what I'm, I'm doing, and what I'm doing, it's something that I'm doing it no matter what you tell me. So you can report whatever you want. I'm not going to listen to what you say. But I let you know symmetrically what I'm going to implement. The proof consists in establishing that once you offer this mechanism, even if the other principle will get to see it, and that goes back to a land question a moment ago, the following is true. The infimum of all possible mechanisms by principle one and all possible continuation equilibria in the game defined by the payoff mechanism gamma one and gamma two of the expected payoff for principle two, this is the expected payoff for principle two, is strictly both found. And we also prove equilibrium existence because we wanted to make the point that the reason why you cannot sustain a certain payoffs is not because you trigger in existence, is because there's a way of protecting yourself which is absent when private disclosures are not considered. So what's the intuition? Intuition is fairly simple. So suppose that um, this mechanism has been offered. Because the decision implementing this mechanism are invariant to M2, there is no reason to consider any signal by principle one. So principle one cannot inflict the payoff which is lower than the one we're after to principle two by sending private signals to the agents. The agents are not acting in principle two mechanisms. So such private signals are redundant and the former proof is along the same lines as the one establishing the revelation principle. Also notice that for P2 to get a payoff of five, it's essential that the decision X1 being implemented with certainty in the low state of the world and X2 in the high state of the world. So you need the help of the agents. So this, is, this is an environment where to get to this payoff, the agents have to help you because the, the agents are the only one who know the state of the world. And now consider the low state of the world. And suppose that agent one has received signal two. So agent one knows that for sure, principle two is implementing the decision Y2. So he's in this situation. He knows that this is the relevant uh, situation for him. So what he wants to do, he wants to minimize the probability of X1 because his payoff is higher when principle one implements X2 than X, X1. 4.5 is greater than one. So he wants to minimize the probability of X1. But that means that uh, if X1 is implemented with certainty in this state of the world, it better be the case that uh, given the messages sent by the other agents, the messages sent by agent one bear no bite. Likewise, in the other state of the world, when agent one learns that uh, principle one is taking decision Y1, he understands that uh, we are in this situation of the world. And then what he wants to do is he wants to minimize the probability of the X2 and maximize the probability of X1, 4.5 being once again greater than one. So again, it has to be the case that given the message sent by the two other agents, these messages have no bite. So just establish that because A1 has become an enemy of principle two, A1 has to be ruled out by the action of principle one mechanism. But also notice that because A3 does not know the state and because it's essential to select different allocations in different states to inflict the payoff of five to principle one, that means that uh, essentially P2 must be in full control. 
But if A2 is in full control and A2 thinks that the probability at least they have the decision why one is implemented and he's not informed other than knowing that uh, we probably greater than a half the decision why one is implemented, when he's in the H state, he doesn't want to implement the decision X2. He too wants to, he too wants to implement the decision X1. So he has become iteratively an ally of the deviating principle P2. That's the logic of private disclosure. It's very robust. So once in Information is privately disclosed to A1, A1 becomes an ally of P2. But then the other agent uh, we have, must have full control, but because the other agent has full control and doesn't know exactly what the state is, excuse me, what the decision selected by principle two is, the other agent is not willing to punish either. Notice the importance of asymmetric disclosure. If the same information was disclosed to the other two agents as well, that the agents could discipline each other. And in fact, that's exactly the logic in Yamashita. But here, the agents are cannot agree on how to punish principle two because they are symmetrically informed of what principle two is, is after. So this result has important implications. It implies that the equilibrium games with principles are restricted to standard mechanisms and not robust. Furthermore, equilibrium payoffs of games in standard mechanism may not be sustainable when private disclosures are feasible. And going back to what uh, Elena indicated a moment ago, please notice that the result is, is fairly general. It extends to setting where contracts on contracts are feasible. It extends to setting where reciprocal mechanisms are feasible. Reciprocal mechanisms are mechanisms that are, are self-referential. They are written in a language that makes them uh, operate as a function of the mechanism offered by other principles. It also extends to environment where principal and agents have access to arbitrary rich randomizing devices. And it also extends, and that was the question by Len, to settings where there is a direct communication channels between the principles. Okay, I have um, um, five more minutes, something like that. Um, I want to use my remaining time to briefly talk about the other direction in which direct disclosure have an impact uh, on uh, the equilibrium set of this mechanism. I want to establish uh, that uh, private disclosure not only destroy equilibria that have been obtained in the literature, but they also open the door to equilibrium allocations that uh, were not sustainable without private disclosure. And once again, no matter the richness, of them. So let's consider a game with this time only two agents. That's enough to make my point. Two principles, four allocations for principle one. I apologize. I would like to do it with only two, but that's the best we could do. Two allocations for principle two, and only agent two has a private type. It's either low or high, the probability size three fourths. Payoffs, again, the payoff of principle two for agent one and agent two, there is no agent three in this example, and the payoff of principle one is constant, are described by this matrix. And what I want to draw your attention to is that uh, P2 gets, gets a payoff of 10, when in the low state, the decision X3 is paired with Y1, or X4 is paired with Y2. It gets a payoff of 10 in the high state when the decision X2 is paired with Y1 or the decision X1 is paired with Y2. For all other combination, it gets a big loss. This loss is called zeta. In fact, it doesn't matter if it's, it's big. So any, any loss will do the job. Okay. Let's consider now a game with signals, and I want to construct an allocation uh, rule that cannot be sustained without signals. So the game with signals is one where there are no signals for principle one, and then uh, there are two signals for principle two when communicating with each of the two agents. And these two signals are labeled one and two. There are no messages for principle two, and the messages for principle one 
consists in soliciting from the agents the exogenous type and the information they receive from principle two. So once again, principle two sends signals to both agents, they are binary and ask for no messages. Principle one sends no signals to the agents, but ask for P2 signals and omega. So that's the simplest game that we can consider. The timing is the same as before. Agent two learns the state, principle of a mechanism. Agents receive signals from principle two. They send messages to principle one. Decisions are finalized. Okay, I want to claim that in this game, the following social choice function can be sustained in equilibrium. When the state of the world is low, then uh, with probability two thirds, the decisions implemented are X3 and Y1. With a complementary probability one third, the decision implemented are X4, Y2. In the high state of the world, probability two thirds X2 is paired with Y1, probability one third, X1 is paired with Y2. Notice that this social choice rule delivers the maximal feasible payoff to principle two, a payoff of 10. So how do you do it? Well, here are the mechanisms that deliver this um, outcome as an equilibrium outcome. Principle two plus the mechanism, it operates as follows. With probability one third, it draws the signal one one. Probability one third, it draws the signal two two. Probability one six, one two. Probability one six, two one. So if you wish, with probability two thirds, the two signals coincide. Probability one third, the two signals differ. When the signals coincide, the decision Y one is implemented. When the signals differ, the decision Y2 is implemented. Notice that the signals carry no information to the agents in this example, contrary to the previous one. So that's what it means. It means that each agent believes that the P2 will implement the Y1 decision with probability two thirds, no matter whether she gets to C1 or two. And also believes that the other agent has received the same signal as hers with probability two thirds. And the rest consists in showing how you can play with uh, this mechanism in conjunction with the other mechanism and sustain the equilibrium outcomes. This can be done by having P1 offer a mechanism that uh, when the two agents uh, report the same signal and the inform agent says that the state of the world is low, it implements X3. When the two agents uh, report different signals and the state is low, X4. When the signals coincide and the reported state is H, X2. When the signals differ and the reported state is H, X1. Now, given these two mechanisms, it's simple algebra, and it's in the paper, to verify that each agent has incentives to tell the truth. And telling the truth means reporting both his exogenous type and the information received from principle two, one of the two signals. Both agents have incentive to tell the truth. And once we tell the truth, you can show that the outcome implemented by constructions are the one that induce the joint distribution I described a moment ago. The difficulty is in showing that you cannot sustain this allocation rule without private disclosure. There's no equilibrium that does support the social choice rule, no matter the richness of the message space. And briefly, what's the intuition? Well, intuition is simple. Because the allocation rule involves perfect correlation among the decision of the two principles, the response of the principles to the messages has to be deterministic, no matter the mechanism offered by the agents, excuse me, by the principles. Furthermore, the only way you can induce this social choice function is to randomize exactly with the probabilities that I described two thirds and one third in each of the two states of the world. Else, the only privately informed agents 
we misrepresent the state. The last step consists in showing that there's no continuation equilibrium that induces this joint distribution. And why is that the case? Because if such an equilibrium exists, then it means that uh, agent two, the informed agent, must have no right of implementation of the outcomes in the high state. Why? Because if he has a bite on the implementation of the outcome in the high state, when the state is low, what the agent could do, well, the agent that could essentially do whatever he does in the other state, but inverting the correlation in the allocation of the two principles, and do strictly better. But this means that uh, there exists equilibrium allocation in games with private disclosure that cannot be sustained in the game without private disclosure, no matter how rich the message space is, in particular, that can be as rich as in Epstein Peters, and even if you allow for public randomized devices. Why am I emphasizing this property? Because some people think, and you know, we thought about it ourselves uh, when we started this project, that maybe the only role of um, these signals is to permit it to go from uh, PB to something that looks like a base correlate equilibrium. But that's not, that's not what is happening here. What is happening here is that the private disclosure changed the incentives of the agents in a fundamentally new way. So even if a principal have access to public randomized device or the agents have access to a public randomized device that they can use to correlate the actions, you will not be able to sustain the outcome that I just described a moment ago. I think I'm, I'm reaching the uh, boundary of the time that was allocated to me. Am I right? Or, uh, so, so the official time is until five. Um, and even if there are other questions after five, we are happy to go on. Thanks a lot. Sorry, I was rushing a little bit. I, no worries. I realized that this must be um, a lot of absorb in, uh, in a limited amount of, of time. And uh, um, hopefully the first example was something that I cover in, in more detail and more digestible. The second one, um, I realized that I went pretty fast over it. Um, I wanted to at least retain the implication of this example. The implication is that uh, the two equilibrium sets are not nested. Not only private disclosure destroy allocation in, in uh, standard games, but they also open the door to allocation that, that can be sustained with private disclosure and which could not be sustained without them. Um, this second result is robust to the possibility of correlation in the choice of mechanism, the possibility of using a reciprocal mechanism, and correlation in the agent messages. Going back to Elaine's question, is not robust to direct and private communication between the principles. So this is a second result that I established. It hinges on the fact that the principal cannot communicate between themselves after the facts, after the agents have sent their messages. If a principal had access not to a sunspot, but to a private correlation device whose outcome is observed only by the two of them after the agents are done with communication, then you can sustain the same sort of choice function. So if you wish, the power of, uh, of the result is in showing that even if uh, that channel is absent, principal cannot communicate privately in a contractable manner after the agents are done with the communication. Even if that is the case, by engaging into private disclosure, principal can supplement to the inexistence or non-availability of a direct communication channel and arrive to the same type of social choice functions. So um, I'm happy to take any questions, uh, 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 super happy to take any questions uh, or to expand on the role of private disclosure in, uh, in, the, second, uh, in the second example. Um, and let me pause for a moment and see if, uh, if there are um, questions at this moment. Alessandro, I have a question. Um, so first, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, Excellent talk. Um, there's lots of intriguing ideas here. I haven't absorbed all of them yet, so I apologize for that. But what I'm wondering is whether the ideas have um, practical impl implications for in, in a real situation. You know, let's say there was a, a, a seller 
um, who has um, multiple units of a homogeneous good, and he's selling to many uh, uh, buyers through a competitive auction. Um, okay. And you were advising him on uh, how to how to do this. You recognized, and and the, the the seller recognized there's asymmetries among the parties, and so you want to um, take that into consideration. But you don't have the um, traditional base of common knowledge that's inherent in the mechanism design analysis. What would you tell the CEO? It's a tough question for the following reason. Um, these games, both with private disclosure and without them, uh, admit multiple equilibria. So the type of recommendations that you make when you have multiple equilibria inevitably uh, hinge on uh, either uh, a sense of one equilibrium being more focal than the others, perhaps the one that leads to the highest joint surplus among the relevant firms, or maybe actually the lowest. Uh, for example, uh, if the CEO in the conversation with me gives me the impression of being uh, someone who is highly risk averse and maybe has the worst case scenario in mind, more than the best case scenario in mind, uh, I will adjust my answer to him accordingly. And in fact, let's play with this argument for a few seconds. Let's suppose that in my conversation with the CEO and the Senator, you know, the guy is not comfortable to say, well, I'm confident that the equilibrium which is advantageous uh, to my firm will prevail one way or the other. He's more like, you know, a max mean type of guy. Then I will say, look, uh, with private disclosure, you can secure profits which are higher than the one you can secure without them. And, uh, uh, and in fact, in a fairly simple manner. So um, let's suppose that you are thinking of uh, an auction with personalized reservation prices. Why? Well, perhaps because you consulted with an auction expert and there are many, you know, you are probably uh, uh, among uh, the one that I can think of, uh, among the most qualified ones. And maybe you got the message from uh, Peter or other consultants that um, uh, a simple adaptation of a traditional rule like an ascending auction with uh, reservation prices can permit you to generate a lot of, of revenue. And you say, actually, and that is totally true, but this is an environment with competing designers where the bidders are participating in the auctions and also in the auctions of other, of other sellers. So what I suggest you do is that uh, you continue to use personalized reservation prices, um, but you don't inform all bidders of all of them. You inform each bidder of uh, their own reservation price. You also commit it to a distribution of RM and you stick to them. And then how you do that? Well, you will have to use a third party and you'll have to introduce uh, a third party that has incentives to respect the randomization that you're after. If you don't have access to that third party, I have a trouble. But if you do have access to such a third party, then I recommend that then you disclose the reservation price to each of the bidder personally and only inform the others of the joint. That will permit you to guarantee yourself a minimal payoff, the analog of my five plus K in this example, which is strictly about the lowest possible payoff that you can expect. If you that, That's very good advice. And the information policy is just right uh, from a practical perspective. Because you, you have serious issues when you start disclosing uh, different reserve prices to the different parties um, uh, in a non-private way. Absolutely. That, that could be an obstacle. I, I totally get it. Uh, um, for theorists, I think it's a challenge because it's an obstacle, but it's an obstacle of the same nature as the one that you face in many ways. When, whenever you have some functionality in the mechanism, that is private. Like think, for example, of um, games where mechanisms also send recommendation to agents. And this recommendation have to be committed to. Uh, typically, they are stochastic in nature. So whenever you have any type of stochasticity along these lines, I do realize that uh, you know there is a little bit of a tension between what we as theorists envision and what uh, is practical. Um, the chief comment that I'm making is that I don't see a difference between the two, but, but I am sensitive to hesitations by practitioners. I, you know, 
quantitative. The only thing that I'm saying is that uh, it's not a different type of commitment vis-a-vis uh, -vis to the one that uh, we typically invoke uh, in making design. Um, of course, a mechanism that is fully transparent in all aspects, it may be more uh, practical in certain ways. Uh, why? Because uh, it does not hinge on a third party verifying the functions uh, of such a mechanism. It also uh, relies on uh, each of the relevant agents monitoring each other and monitoring the designer in the way things are implemented. That's an advantage. So in, in that respect, at this moment, I, I don't have much to, to add, so. Sandro, can I, can I ask a question? Sure, uh, who's, who's talking? Uh, you know, Roland, hi. Hey. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for this great talk. Um, so I'm, I'm still stuck to the first example and the whole, whole setup that you, that you have. So uh, is my understanding correct? So you first send private messages to your agents and you commit to a mechanism that that uh, commits the action to a message of the agent who, who then sends a message of the agent and the the message that you send to the agent. Correct. And then and then afterwards, at the very end, all these private messages these are revealed, so that we can actually see what those messages are, so that we can actually check that the, that we are committed to the mechanism. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, so, so that sounds a little bit that, that describing your your outcome just by this function SM to delta A. So the one the slide you have here is not sufficient to describe everything. There's also this strategy this of the messages that I'm sending privately to the agents. Is that correct? So the mechanism has two components: um, the sigma and the phi. This, yeah, uh, the, the sigma. Yeah, the sigma is the private part. Um, but it's pre-committed. I think this is what we, we debated with Peter a moment ago, you know, whether we, whether okay. we okay. potentially created some problems in certain applications. So the Sigma, it's a distribution over the reservation price in the example that I was discussing with Peter a moment ago. So you're randomizing with a certain probability on two agents are getting a reservation price of five and six, and with a complementary probability, we would get, uh, if, you know, uh, and, 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 and the well, third thing is then that at the end, every, all these private messages are actually revealed. So the other principle sees this, right? You need that. No, I don't need it, but uh, I, can, I can allow it because in, in the end, it's too late to change anything in the sense that you committed to this rule. Yeah, but who checks? Who checks? This yeah. rule has to be checked, right? So enforcer. The enforcer. So there must be a law enforcer. The same enforcer that... Uh, the same judge that implements uh, the mechanism in the absence of uh, yeah, but this judge has to see the S's, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so these S's have, have to be revealed at the end to the to the checker to this checker. The don't necessarily have to be revealed to other designers. Okay, okay, but yes. So this sounds a little very much like these mediated contracts of of Raman. Am I correct? Um, there he gives kind of recommendations, but also the recommendations are private. And in the end, the, the allocation depends also on what his recommendations are, uh, which are given privately. And these are also revealed publicly at the end. Um, do you, you know what, what mechanism? Yeah, I know the paper. Um, there is a connection that we, we discussed it uh, among the, uh, the four of us and uh, we cite the paper in the, in, the, in the draft that we have. Um, there's a connection uh, definitely in, in spirit it is related, but uh, in, um, in that environment, the role of the private disclosure is to discipline the efforts of, uh, of the agents. Um, here, um, the analog of that is, you know, they may not discipline the behavior in my own mechanism, but they influence the way they behave in the mechanism of another designer. Sure, sure, you can see that, but you could see the other mechanism designer as an agent, which you, which the, your principle two is trying to influence the behavior of principle one, who, from his point of view, is an agent somehow. It's, that, it's important that you made that comment because that's exactly the point of departure with Raman. In Raman, the primitive game is given. That's what I said. You're trying to influence uh, 
you know, more or less in teams by providing uh, this asymmetric information about how you're going to respond to the outcome of, uh, of a team. Okay. One of the difficulties for our result is that as soon as they do it, the other principal may adjust the mechanism accordingly, and maybe they still hope to restore the full theorem and, uh, and also the result in the second part of the paper. So the extra difficulty that we are facing relative to Raman is the one that uh, I think you spotted, is the fact that uh, the overall interaction among the agents is not held fixed. So once they do all of this, the other principal may adjust the mechanism accordingly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, okay, okay thanks. At a very deep level, um, you're totally right to run a basic connection. Is it correct? In spirit, at the very minimum, basic connection. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thanks to you. Actually, I should have uh, uh, mentioned that myself. Okay, are there any other questions? If not, then we are perfect in time, actually. And uh, did you want to add something? Oh yeah, I have uh, my most important slide. Uh, give me one second, I'm moving. Uh, so the problem with the iPad is that it doesn't have uh, the possibility of jumping. Uh, this is the, by far the most important slide. So uh, a big thank to all the organizer and uh, the, the audience. Um, thanks a lot for your patience. Uh, it's a heavy paper, so um, I hope the message went through, the details, uh, um, need a little bit of time to grasp um, the connections. Uh, we are still in the process uh, of understanding them ourselves. Um, so we find this fascinating, but we're far away from having reached the point where we are done. We, we know everything about now this class of games with, uh, with private disclosure. So big thank you to everyone and don't forget VS. So.